Um, pretty, uh, this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I've been sort of fascinated by this topic for, geez, almost 30 years now. Um, I think I started consuming spirulina in 1987. I read, uh, I was teaching myself how to backpack that year out of a book that I bought. And the last couple pages of the book, um, the author was talking about some guy who hiked the last 100 miles of the Appalachian Trail eating nothing but spirulina. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. And I was like, what is that stuff? i got to find out what that is. And uh, So I researched it and found out where I could get some, and I've been pretty much eating spirulina ever since. So. Um, and certainly it was sort of my segue into the whole idea of uh, superfoods. There's a little handout right there you can grab. Um, and it's just sort of expanded from there. So, first thing I guess we should talk about is what is a superfood? And that is kind of a nebulous thing. I mean, there's, you know, basically it's a food that's really rich in micronutrients. Um, and that's really what we're needing these days um, is micronutrients. There's very few humans in the modern world in the United States that are deficient in macronutrients, in protein, carbohydrates, and, and fat. Um, most of us are getting plenty of those. Um, but what we're severely lacking in is micronutrients. So superfoods are foods that are incredibly rich in micronutrients. And by micronutrients, I mean minerals, vitamins, phytonutrients, enzymes, um, so antioxidants. These are nutrients that our body requires in small quantities. Um, and unfortunately, these are the things that most of us are deficient in um, in the modern world. And a big part of why that's the case is because of the fact that our soil is so depleted these days. Modern farming techniques are definitely not the best to build the health of the soil. Um, you know, conventional farmers just put three nutrients back into the soil. NPK is the fertilizer they use. That's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So they're putting nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium back into the soil, but nothing else. And so they've, scientists have found that those three um, nutrients um, are um, used or necessary for plants to grow big, beautiful looking plant bodies. Um, so that's all they put in the soil. And the rest of the nutrients are seriously, seriously deficient. It doesn't seem to affect the, the actual look of the plant, but it certainly affects the health of the plant. Um, interestingly enough, these chemical fertilizers are really a remnant of World War II. Back when the war ended, uh, we um, were creating fertilizers uh, using these, these uh, elements and we didn't know what to do with all the residue we had left since we weren't building so many bombs anymore. But somebody figured out that these nutrients, sodium, I'm sorry, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, really make plants grow big. And so we started putting this into our soil to, to grow food. Um, and as a result of this practice, um, our soils become seriously deficient in micronutrients. You know, all the other nutrients like zinc and calcium and magnesium that we desperately need, we're not really getting enough of those from our food anymore. And it's really a bit of a double whammy because when you only feed your soil uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, and um, potassium, um, your plants aren't healthy. They may look healthy, but they're not healthy. And so nature knows when something's not healthy and it sends in, you know, insects or fungus or something to start eating up that thing and degrade it so that it can go back into the soil and build healthy soil. So plants that are healthy just get eaten alive by insects. And this necessitates the use of all these pesticides and herbicides and insecticides and that we're spraying on our crops that are basically poisons. Another interesting fact, the pesticides also came out of World War II. They were part of this um, biological warfare that was being developed in World War II. And after the war, we didn't have anything to do with this stuff, and we figured out that we could spray it on our plants and it would prevent the bugs from eating our plants up. So now we're spraying all these poisons onto our plants to keep them alive because they're so unhealthy because the soil is allowed to become so depleted. Um, and guess what? Those pesticides and herbicides destroy all the soil-based microbes that are in the soil. Um, and the soil-based microbes are really what secrete folic acid. Um, folic acid is like the magical nutrient. Folic and humic acids, these organic acids that are in soil secreted by uh, microbes are the magic ingredients in the soil that will take the inorganic rock minerals 
and really transform them into an organically bound state that the plants can bring up into their plant bodies. So because we're killing all the soil-based microbes with our pesticides and whatnot, if, even if there were any zinc and calcium and magnesium and manganese and molybdenum, etc. in the soil, the plants wouldn't be able to bring it up into their plant bodies anyways because there's no soil-based organisms. They've all been nuked by the pesticides and now there's no folic acid to transform the rock minerals into organically bound state that the plants could actually work with. Even organic farms? <clears throat> or just well, organic, organic farms are not spraying, right? Mm -hmm. So the, at least we know that there's soil-based microbes in organic fields. Mm -hmm. um, but organic farming doesn't mandate the use of compost. Compost is food, organic matter that is decaying, and compost is food for the soil-based microbes. So organic farming does not mandate the use of compost to feed the soil-based microbes, it just encourages it. So if you've got an organic farmer, like a lot of these big organic farms in California that have bought up, been basically bought out by you know, conventional farmers. They bought out these organic farms because they wanted to get in on the action because they figured out they could make a lot of money. And so now they, they take over these organic farms that are now thousands of acres because they've bought up numerous farmland. Um, and uh, they're just in it for the money, basically. They're not in it for the love of what they're doing. And so they're like cutting corners and doing the bare minimum and they're, they're just not spraying their, their fields. They're not really working the health of the soil to build the soil-based microbes by adding compost, um, to add all the manures and, and organic fertilizers to add the nutrients back into the soil. So just because something's organically grown doesn't necessarily mean it's micronutrient rich. It just means that it's not necessarily full of poison that's it's been sprayed with. So the bottom line is we're not getting what we need. I mean, modern humans, I mean, we're living in a time when we're like stressed 24-7. I mean, the indigenous cultures were way less stressed than we were. I mean, studies have shown that these people, on average, are working like 13 hours to a week to supply their food needs. The rest of the time was, you know, frolicking and playing games and connecting in community and doing whatever they felt like, you know. We're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week um, in high-stress environments, so we're stressed. And guess what it takes to deal with all that stress? It takes micronutrients. You know, when you're stressed, you're burning through your B vitamins. Um, you need minerals to activate those vitamins. Um, so at a time, and also we're in this toxic world, we're exposed to massive amounts of toxins. It takes minerals and vitamins for our body to process those toxins for our liver to detoxify um, these toxins and get them out of our body. So really, modern humans need more micronutrients than humans have ever needed before in the history of the human species, and we're getting way less. So is it any wonder we're all so sick and, and tired? Um, so the, the reality is that we're, we're desperate for micronutrients in the modern world. And, and so the question then becomes, how do we get it? How do we get these micronutrients? So, um, you know, in the last 50 to 70 years, there's been a bit of a revolution in, in science where we've identified all these, quote, vitamins, these compounds in food that our bodies need because our bodies can't make them. We, we've uh, certainly um, come to realize there's 70 plus trace minerals that our body needs to run an efficient metabolism. So we've identified all these things and we've started to be able to synthesize these things in a laboratory in the form of pills that contain the vitamins and the minerals and we can take these pills and hopefully get our needs met. But the reality is what we can synthesize in a laboratory is not really the ideal form for these nutrients to be in. Um, we, you know, a conventional multivitamin, kind of like a centrum that you'll find um, in a Walmart shelf or whatever, um, the, the vitamins are basically created in a laboratory. Um, and they're created via chemistry. Like, for instance, ascorbic acid is created in like a five step chemical process from corn sugar. A lot of the B vitamins are made out of coal tar, petroleum. Um, product. Um, so the, these nutrients are basically being isolated and created via chemistry in a laboratory. And um, I mean the reality is, the, the, the truth is, you know, there are no vitamins. I mean that might, might seem a little confusing, but there, there is no vitamin C. There's nothing you can pin vitamin C on and say, there it is, there's a vitamin C. The reality is vitamins are actually a complex biological process 
that involves many different things. So you have vitamin activity, you have vitamin C activity in the body, but there really is no one thing that's vitamin C. But in our reductionist mindset, where we try to hone in on what vitamin C is, we've kind of honed in on this ascorbic acid, and we call that vitamin C. I mean, I see calling ascorbic acid vitamin C like sort of calling the skin of the orange the orange. Um, there's much more to vitamin C than just ascorbic acid. There's dozens of cofactors that we've identified that are really required to be present with that ascorbic acid for the ascorbic acid to function like vitamin C in the body. So when you consume an isolated vitamin like thiamine or niacin or riboflavin or ascorbic acid or which people call vitamin C, um, what happens is your body kind of doesn't know what to do with it. It's like, well, geez, what do I do with this? This kind of looks like vitamin C, but it, it missing a few things. I know. Well, I think I'm going to take some some rutin from here, some bioflavonoids from here, and some factor J here, factor K here. I'm going to bring this up and add it to this ascorbic acid that I just consumed to make vitamin C activity. Um, so really, what happens when you take large potencies, high potencies of these isolated synthetic substances is it really taxes, it mobilizes all the cofactors that you happen to have floating around your tissue for these nutrients so that they can actually be functional as the vitamin activity. Um, so you can really begin to deplete your body um, in, these, in these cofactors. It can literally start to rob these cofactors from your tissues and you become deficient. I mean, you could potentially even create a vitamin C deficiency in your body if you take massive amounts of ascorbic acid over a period of time, you eventually use up all the rutin, which is required for vitamin C activity. And then you can take all the ascorbic acid in the world and you're not going to get any vitamin C activity because there's no rutin left. You've, you've used it all up by these high dosages of, of vitamin C. And then you know, when you take these synthetic vitamins, you get this neon yellow urine coming out typically, not so much for the fat soluble, for the, for the water soluble, which is really an indication that your liver and kidneys are being burdened to basically get rid of this stuff. And not all of it can be converted into functional vitamin activity, only a percentage, oftentimes a small percentage of, the, of these high potency synthetic isolates that you take can actually be converted into um, functional uh, vitamin activity. The rest is a burden on your eliminative organs to get rid of. Um, so while I take some isolated synthetic nutrients, because if that's the only form you're going to be able to find for your vitamin B12, better to take it than not, because your body's going to be able to put together some vitamin B12 activity um, from that nutrient. So it's a godsend that we have these things. I mean, that we've actually been able to create these things in the laboratory. But they're not the best forms for us to get our nutrition. You can literally get depleted in things if you're taking these high potency synthetic isolates over time. So if we can get our nutrients from food, if we can get our needs met from food, that's the best. Because that's, you're not going to create any nutrient imbalances in your body over time if you're getting your nutrients from food. Because food is very balanced. Um, and it contains all the, the cofactors. I mean, another issue is, is minerals. If you look at minerals, you know, if you look at the minerals on a typical supplements uh, uh, panel, you're, you'll see two words typically. You'll see like calcium carbonate, magnesium citrate, zinc picolinate, etc. Um, so when you see two words like that, you're looking at a mineral salt. And a mineral salt is basically an inorganic compound um, that is not very bioavailable in your body. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's basically a ground up rock effectively what it is. Um, sometimes some of these ground up mineral salts are actually used in, in terms of industrial uh, processes and, and sometimes you have the ground up rocks that have been processed with an acid like for instance calcium carbonate which is limestone processed with citric acid equals calcium citrate which is a little more absorbable into our bloodstream than calcium carbonate apparently but you know, I'm a little hesitant. I, honestly, if I have calcium carbonate in this hand and calcium citrate in this hand, I might choose to take the calcium carbonate because, you know, calcium carbonate, a lot of that's going to pass through my digestive system, not the other end without doing a lot of damage. The calcium citrate might actually get into my bloodstream. And in my mind, that could be a potential problem because calcium requires a lot of different things to be functional. All the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin K2, vitamin A, vitamin D3, um, magnesium, uh, phosphorus, um, numerous um, things that are per required to be present with calcium. And if those things aren't there, 
That calcium, if it gets into your bloodstream, could potentially cause some problems. It could cause calcification of your tissues because your body doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't have the cofactors required to process it properly. Your body's calcium metabolism is all out of whack. So instead of that calcium depositing in your bones and, and your teeth where it should, um, it potentially could deposit in your soft tissue. Um, you know, like in your kidneys and you get kidney stones. Um, or in your um, arteries and you get arterial plaque building up. A lot of um, the arterial plaque has been discovered to be containing calcium. Um, you know, so it could contaminate your joints, deposit in your joints to start to cause calcification of your uh, cartilage and whatnot and lead to arthritis. So I don't really want these inorganic minerals coming into my body in a, in a big way necessarily um, unless I'm seriously deficient. Yeah, I mean, then if that's the only way you can get it, better that than nothing. But you do your homework and try to figure out what all the cofactors are and make sure you've got lots of different nutrients your body knows how to process these minerals properly. Um, but still, you know, it's not the best. If we can get our minerals from food, that's way better because the, if you put that calcium carbonate on the soil, the soil-based microbes secrete folic acid. Folic acid actually breaks down rocks. It starts to decompose rocks into much smaller particles. Eventually, taking that calcium carbonate and breaking apart the calcium and carbonate bond to get monoatomic calcium that then gets absorbed into the folic acid compound and the folic acid compound gets brought up into the plant body and when calcium is in that folic acid compound, it's what's known as organically bound. And it's in the food with all the other synergistic nutrients um, that are required for proper calcium metabolism. Um, and it's highly bioavailable when it's in that organically bound state. So it's way better if we can, if we can do this. So some of the, some of the um, multivitamin companies and supplement companies have sort of figured this out. They figured out that yes, inorganic mineral salts, Synthetic isolated vitamins, awesome, we've got them, awesome, we can use them if we need, but we can make them better. We can actually take these things and feed them to a yeast culture, or a culture that contains yeast and other probiotic organisms. And that culture will then eat the inorganic mineral salts and isolated synthetic vitamins. And so then when you eat these, what I would call food-grown supplements, and we have a company that we work with here in the clinic uh, called Innate who does this. Um, when you eat these food-grown nutrients, food-grown multivitamins, they're way more bioavailable because when the culture consumes the inorganic mineral salt, it will break apart the, the salt and release the organically, release the monoatomic nutrients that can then become organically bound in the yeast culture. And then you eat that yeast culture, you get an organically bound nutrient that's highly bioavailable with the cofactors because yeast is incredibly nutrient rich. Um, and same thing with vitamins. The, the culture will consume these isolated synthetic vitamins and because the culture is so rich in nutrients, it's going to have a lot of the cofactors there with it. And the vitamins are going to be much more bioavailable. If you take a traditional um, B vitamin supplement and consume it, you're going to pee out this neon yellow urine. If you take a food grown B vitamin supplement and consume it, you'll notice a little yellow urine, but it is significantly reduced, which is a sign that this nutrient is way more compatible with your physiology. Um, so, food grown nutrients are a huge upgrade, but once again, in my opinion, they're not as good as actual food. Um, so, I'm personally way into food. Food is, uh, you know, food, there's so much more to um, nutrition than simply isolated nutrients like vitamin C and magnesium and calcium. There's so much magic in nature that actually gets put into the food. And when we eat food, one of the things we get is light. Um, it turns out our DNA has the ability to emit and absorb light. And this is a critical nutrient for our bodies. It actually, um, when we absorb a lot of light into the DNA in our cells, um, our cells are able to communicate with other cells much more effectively. It kind of amplifies their, the cell's energy body. And the cell becomes very alive and vital and is able to communicate effectively um, with other cells. I mean, there's a whole energy body that um, is sort of the template for the physical body. And as you absorb more and more light into your DNA, your energy body gets energized and your physical body becomes a lot more 
vital and, and healthy. And we get, when we eat food that has DNA, we literally are able to absorb some light from the food. And that feeds our cells and our body becomes more alive. Um, we don't really get light from ascorbic acid or thiamine or niacin or calcium carbonate. Um, and in fact, those nutrients require our cells to potentially give up some light to sort of re-energize those nutrients with energy with, so that they can be incorporated into living tissue. So we actually potentially lose some, some of our light energy um, when we consume those nutrients. So the food contributes so much more than just these isolated micronutrients that we discovered. It contributes things we potentially have not even discovered yet. And superfoods are what I've been really focused on for 20 plus years now. Um, so let's talk about some of these superfoods that um, and I've written down a couple, this sheet is what you want to look at, a couple pages worth of superfoods here that you might want to consider uh, incorporating some of these into your diet. One thing I, I will say, to caution you guys about, one thing, I'm kind of jaded in this topic a bit because I've been in this superfood world for so long. I've been to all these, you know, conferences where very charismatic speakers are up there talking about the latest and greatest superfood. And then after the lecture is done, everyone flocks to the booth where that superfood is being sold and buy it. People are fighting over each other. And it's just like, oh my God, you know, it, it, it's like, um, you know, superfoods are great. And you can definitely benefit by consuming lots of superfoods. But the important thing is your diet. I mean, and these superfoods can be expensive, so I definitely don't encourage you if you have, um, if your diet is not dialed in, you know, which is probably 80% of the diet component of your health. If your diet component is not dialed in, don't go spend a bunch of money on these superfoods thinking you're going to feel better if you're eating a bunch of high glycemic food and, and you're not getting healthy fats and um, you're not getting, you know, adequate um, balance in your diet. Um, you're eating a lot of foods with chemicals that have been highly processed, and you're thinking that you're going to add a few of these sort of foods, in, superfoods in your diet, and, and solve all those problems. You're fooling yourself. I mean, the first thing to focus on is getting your digestion in shape, getting your diet um, dialed in, and then with any extra money that you've got to put towards quality supplementation. Purchase some superfoods. Um, so I, I, I want to put this in proper perspective and not contribute to what I see as a problem in the industry, which is glamorization of superfoods. Um, you know, I've personally been consuming superfoods for 25 years. I love them, um, but they're not the maybe 10, 20 percent of the of the picture. Your diet is the big important part of that. So um, don't go chase it after these superfoods before you really work on getting the rest of your diet um, in line. So the, let's kind of go through some of these here and talk about them. Um, cacao nibs, uh, cacao is chocolate. Chocolate actually grows on trees. Um, kind of a cool thing if you ever see a chocolate tree. And, and it grows as a bean. It grows in these big pods full of these beans. And the beans are fermented and then dried and the beans break apart easily into little chunks called nibs, so cacao nibs. You can also buy the beans whole, they haven't been broken apart yet, you can buy cacao powder. This is chocolate that hasn't been processed, hasn't been heated, um, still enzymatically active and, and none of the nutrients have been degraded through high heat. So you can buy this in the refrigerated section of the bulk department at the co-op actually. Um, chocolate is very high in magnesium, very high in antioxidants, it's one of the highest levels of antioxidants in any food. Um, I think the only food I'm aware of that's higher in antioxidants than chocolate is chaga mushrooms. Um, so uh, cacao is a phenomenal way to really bring inflammation down in your body unless you consume it with a bunch of sugar in a traditional chocolate bar because sugar is highly inflammatory. Um, there's chocolate bars sold at the co-op by a little artesian company out of Portland called Stirs the Soul, which I really like. And you know, the, they've got them sweetened just minimally, like half of a date is the sweetener in these chocolate bars. Just enough sweetness that it's not super bitter, and it tastes decent, you know, but not enough sweetness you're like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing ever, or excessive sweetness. 
Um, and cacao has so much fat that these are not glycemic experiences to consume these chocolate bars. Stay away from the ones with agave nectar. Agave is really rich in fructose, isolated fructose, which is not good for your liver. Um, you, you know, great way to stoke your appetite and feel like you got the munchies 24-7 is to eat a bunch of agave nectar. Um, so I, I don't recommend that food. Well, beet sugar. Beet sugar? Um, good question. I haven't really uh, looked at the profile of that sugar as to what the, the components are. You know, you have, and there's sucrose, which is like 50% glucose, 50% fructose, and then there's just isolated fructose, like high fructose corn syrup, and agave is more fructose than most high fructose corn syrups. Um, I don't know about beet sugar, though. I don't know what the profile is, and I don't know how that's processed, so I have to just investigate it, which I can do. I get that feeling. Thanks. So, um, I'll shoot you email. <laughs> that would actually be an interesting program because a lot of us are seeking alternatives, mm -hmm. and we go and buy these things, and we don't necessarily know. I bought some agave. I haven't used it. I think you mentioned it in one of your other programs. Mm -hmm. that. You know, don't that wasn't a particularly good one, so I haven't used it. But you know, we don't know, and there yeah. are a lot of choices out there. Totally, totally, um, and, and absolutely, and, and that's you know what I do is I just I'm interested in being healthy myself, so I investigate everything for myself, and I try to share with as many people as possible what I've learned from my own journey. Um, so cacao nibs, you can throw them in a smoothie. I'm going to talk about smoothies, how to how to take these superfoods. A lot of these superfoods don't taste so great, so how do you eat them? How do you get them in you without just like gagging? So smoothies, my solution. There are other ways. You can make homemade chocolate, throw some of these things in there, which I do as well. But smoothie is the easiest solution. So I'm going to talk about, I've got a smoothie recipe that I'll talk about um, with you guys uh, and, and to help you start to understand how to get some of these into your diet. Tocotrienol is just one of the richest sources of vitamin E and all the different fractions of vitamin E, not just the... Uh, uh, the, um, the alpha fraction, and uh, I can't remember the names of all the different fractions of vitamin E, but tocotrienols have all the different fractions, um, not just one. Most vitamin E supplements are just one of the fractions of vitamin E. Tocotrienols have all. And they're also rich in selenium, a very uh, common nutrient that people are deficient in. Just got a NutriVal test done showing I'm a little low in selenium. So three Brazil nuts a day is a great way to get selenium into your body. And each Brazil nut has like one to two hundred percent of the RDA of selenium. So assuming you're absorbing your nutrients well, you can get your selenium that way. What is this though? Is this just vitamin E supplement? I don't know it, it's actually an extract from rice bran. So you just um, look for it at the store, because I'm confused. So you just look at the store and it says that It says tocotrienols. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and by the way, as we're going through these superfoods, if you look at uh, this sheet right here, and you're wondering where to get these things, everything I'm going to talk about is found in one of these 13 companies. And I've given you little descriptions of what each company sells so you kind of know which company to go to based on what you're looking for. Um, so tocotrienols you can get from like Longevity Warehouse. Um, and um, I think of all the things I've listed on here, Longevity Warehouse would be the only one that's selling tocotrienols. So number five, you could pick up some tocotrienols if you want. They're delicious. They're a fabulous addition to a smoothie. It's a really no grit powder, and you add a couple tablespoons to a smoothie. It's absolutely delicious. It is not high carb, even though it's from brand. So you don't have to worry about jacking up your glycemic uh, index uh, by taking tocotrienols. It's just a great way to get massive amounts of vitamin E, all the different fractions in your body. There's also CoQ10 in there, alpha lipoic acid, various flavonoids, uh, essential fatty acids. It's just a highly nutrient rich. Um, great way to bring down inflammation in your body. Um, great way to protect the healthier arteries. Um, so definitely a fabulous superfood. Hemp seeds, probably the most nutritious seed on planet Earth. Yeah. Can I jump back to the tocotrienol? Sure. Um, what about rice bran oil? I recently came across some rice bran oil. Sure. I don't really recommend that because I looked at the fatty acid profile of that at one point and it's pretty high in some of the essential fatty acids, specifically I think the omega-6. Mm -hmm. And it's sitting usually in a clear mm -hmm. container yeah. in a grocery store shelf. So there's a lot of rancidity in that oil by the time you purchase okay. it because light will degrade those very fragile oils. Uh, so it wouldn't have tocotrienol in it because it was a rice bran oil? Or it's probably got some vitamin E okay. in there, but okay. not nearly the concentration that you're okay. going to get from the, the tocotrienol uh, powder. Um, hemp seeds, probably the most nutritious 
Seed on planet Earth, these are a big part of my diet personally. Yeah, about 33% protein, um, just loaded with minerals. Uh, perfect essential fatty acid profile, three times more omega-6s than omega-3s. Um, so I personally eat tons of hemp seeds, very low hypoallergenic. Um, I'll probably eat six to ten tablespoons of hemp seeds a day sometimes. Um, just a great way to get protein. Uh, chia seeds, another incredibly nutrient rich seed that I really like to consume because they're very rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, which your body can hopefully convert DPA and DHA if your metabolic uh, machinery is working properly. I have a question um, about hemp yeah. seeds. Do they need to be organic? Because I can't ever find organic hemp seeds. Hemp seeds don't, they're, it's such a hardy plant. Even the ones that aren't organic are not heavily sprayed and virtually pesticide free. So yeah, I mean it's not critical to have organic hemp seeds. Um, but it's nice because you know for certain there's been no spray, but I've seen pesticide uh, tests done on quote natural hemp seeds and there's virtually no pesticide residue in there. Um, but you can certainly find our Nutiva sells some nice organic hemp seeds. Nutiva also sells chia seeds. Uh, as I said, chia seeds are also incredibly rich in antioxidants, very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, um, and they're a great way to keep the glycemic nature of your diet down because they're loaded with this mucilaginous fiber that will time release any kind of sweet thing into your blood. So what a great addition to a smoothie, chia seeds. I mean, it's a, you throw some chia seeds in your smoothie, you've just dramatically reduced the glycemic index of that smoothie. Do you um, soak them before you put them in your smoothie? You can. Let them get that, you know, mucilaginous thing going? You can, or you can just blend them into your smoothie without soaking, and as you blend them in, and the smoothie sits either in the refrigerator or your stomach, the mucilaginous okay. aspect is going to come to bear and you're old basically. Uh, that mucilaginous fiber is soluble fiber. That's phenomenal food for your friendly bacteria. It's like a prebiotic. Aussie berry, I, I, I probably should get this one out of this list. Frankly, it kind of triggers me. Aussie berry has been so hyped. Aussie berry is basically the South American blueberry. I mean, it's no better or worse than blueberries. So, but it's been just hype to the extreme, you know, you find one little compound in OCE that stimulates metabolism and then you write an article about how OCE stimulates metabolism and, and, and how this one ingredient in OCE that's in and there in small quantities stimulates metabolism and therefore contributes to weight loss <laughs> and, and write a big article about how people have lost all this weight taking massive amounts of OCE and before you know it there's a stampede to OCE and this is the kind of thing that happens so you know it's like OCE is great but you know, don't think you're gonna lose a bunch of weight to eat a bunch of Aussie when your diet's crap. You know, um, so Aussie is great, but yeah, don't think that it's the answer to all your problems. Um, Almond berry is another phenomenal source of uh, vitamin C. Um, most concentrated source of vitamin C in a ripe fruit in the plant kingdom. There are a couple other vitamin C rich berries like kamakamu and uh, um, acerola cherry that are picked green because that's when the vitamin C content is the highest. And green fruit that's not fully ripe is probably going to have some compounds in it that are not ideal to consume. Fruit generally is like that. It has some compounds that are not helpful to consume um, until it ripens. And then it wants to be consumed. And then, and then the birds show up. The day the fruit ripens, the birds show up and start eating it, right? But they don't touch it before that because birds know what's up. You know, so a little, um, you know, Kamu Kamu and Ace Roller Cherry are great sources of vitamin C, but there may be some non ideal things in the uh, Kamu Kamu and, and Ace Roller Cherry as a result. So I really like a Amla Berry. It's also an Ayurvedic herb that's been traditionally used. It's got a lot of medicinal properties that, that really, uh, you know, promote health in the body. So I really like Amla Berry. But, Kamakamu and Acerola cherry I do consume as well. We've got a really great Kamakamu uh, supplement here um, that we sell. So if you're looking for some Kamakamu to add to your smoothie, you get some highly bioavailable food-based vitamin C that contains all the cofactors. That's not going to generate that yellow urine. That's not going to rob cofactors from your tissues or burn your liver and kidneys with the, getting rid of the isolated nutrients. Um, this is a great way to do it. And one of the things you're looking for in a package system, by the way, when you look at superfoods, packaging is kind of critical, um, especially with vitamin C. Vitamin C is probably the most fragile vitamin that we know. 
Um, you cut open a cantaloupe and you put that in the refrigerator and the next morning you open the fridge to go eat it, probably 50% of the vitamin C is already gone. Um, so vitamin C is, is easily degraded by light, heat, or oxygen. Um, and all plastic allows oxygen to get through slowly. If you got a really hard plastic, like this material, it's extremely hard plastic. So oxygen may be getting through here, but it's happening at such a slow rate, there's going to be very little degradation happening with this common canoe. Um, ideally, you're looking for a glass container. You're looking for a glass container that's been either nitrogen flushed, or it has an oxygen absorber in the bottle, so when you open the bottle, it pops as oxygen rushes in, and then there's no degradation possible, especially if it's amber glass, because that prevents light from getting in. Light will, will degrade the, the nutrients as well. So, you know, it, it kind of cracks me up sometimes when I see, um, um, you know, uh, these superfood blends marketed as high ORAC, ORAC being a measure of the antioxidant potential. Antioxidants are easily degraded when they're in the presence of oxygen or light, um, specifically oxygen. And uh, so you know, they're in this saw, I mean, I'm thinking of one company specifically markets their green product as a high ORAC greens and super soft plastic, which is very readily permeable to oxygen. So yeah, it might have had a high ORAC value at one point, but by the time you buy it, when it's been sitting on the shelf in the grocery store for months and maybe in the production shelf for months before that, the antioxidants are toast. You know, so, so packaging is important with, with these superfoods. If you can get them in glass, amber glass, that's really the best way to go. Um, ink and berries, another great vitamin C rich berry that's actually 16% protein. That's as much protein as in, in uh, um, chia. Uh, I'm sorry, um, um, quinoa, which is known to be a high protein grain. So very rich in protein. I love the sour flavor in the ink and berries. They sell these over at uh, the call. I get them in bulk, put them in my smoothies. Um, what do you say to people who OD on those? Because I get, I feel like when I have a sweet um, craving, I either have mulberries or goji berries, or I have um, gold, golden berries also, and I want to like just go to town. Yeah, well, I, I definitely would never go to town on a dried fruit unless it's um, put with in a smoothie with lots of fat and protein to keep your blood sugar from spiking. Okay. Um, you know, dried fruit is very concentrated sugar for the most part and it's not really something I would recommend consuming um, unless it's with fat and protein. So, um, goji berries, probably the most nutritious food on planet Earth. Um, goji berries uh, um, stimulate the body to produce more human growth hormone. Um, so they're very, it's a very rejuvenative food. Um, Rich in B vitamins, uh, contain all essential amino acids, something like 12% protein in goji berries. Fabulous, uh, just off the charts in beta carotene. Second highest content of betaine of any food. Beets are the highest. Betaine's a um, B vitamin like compound that basically supports methylation in the body, which is something the body has to do to detoxify and to run many other different metabolic processes. Um, so increasing your methylation, you're going to start to feel better. Your body's going to start to detoxify a lot more effectively. So that's one of the reasons why goji berries are such great food and why beets are such great food. Um, bee pollen, possibly the most nutrient dense food on planet Earth. Um, it's just loaded with B vitamins. It's like 25% protein. Um, Thousands of different enzymes contained in bee pollen, um, and, and uh, so that's a great addition to a smoothie. Um, the algaes, the edible microalgaes that people are consuming, chlorella, spirulina, and klamath lake algae, which is also known as blue green algae. Um, these are three algaes which are very comparable to bee pollen. Bee pollen and these three algaes are probably the four most nutritious, nutritionally dense foods on the planet Earth. These algaes are like 60 to 70 percent protein, complete protein, um, and pretty much every micronutrient your body requires is in them. Not necessarily in high quantities. Some of the micronutrients in algae are in high quantities. Massive amounts of carotenoids in these algaes, which is like a precursor to vitamin A in your body. Um, some of the carotenoids, anyways. Um, massive amounts of iron in these algaes. Um, 
You know, chlorella is probably a little better at supporting detoxification and rejuvenation in your body than the other algaes. Um, chlorella has got a unique phytonutrient called chlorella growth factor that uh, is very um, uh, effective at stimulating rejuvenation in your cells, even your nerve cells. Um, chlorella has also got a fibrous cell wall that bonds onto heavy metals and pesticides and chemicals and prevents them from being reabsorbed in your intestinal tract, carried out of your body via bowel movement. Um, spirulina is really good for immune health. It stimulates stem cell production in the bone marrow. So your stem cells in the bone marrow are what produce your red and white blood cells. So spirulina is a fabulous way to stimulate production of uh, red blood cells and white blood cells, which are the cells of your immune system. The red blood cells are the cells that carry oxygen in your blood to all your different cells. And blue-green algae is another um, um, form of, it's another variety of, of a blue-green algae. Spirulina is a blue-green algae. So blue-green algae is, is algae from Klamath Lake. It's not spirulina, but it's another variety of cyanobacteria, which is a blue-green algae, just like spirulina. Um, and it's every bit as nutrient-rich as spirulina. It's actually, I see the algae from Klamath Lake, though, as being more brain food, um, because it's got neuropeptides in there that function like neurotransmitters. So it's like an infusion of neurotransmitters into your, into your brain. I, I've literally created a, um, altered states of consciousness by eating a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, the, the, how I understand it is basically an infusion of neurotransmitters into my brain and I kind of got blissed out for a period of time. Um, lasted for a couple hours when I eat massive quantities of blue green algae just as an experiment at one point. Um, so, you know, it's definitely known to support mental emotional health more than the other algaes because of those neuropeptides that are, that are in there. Uh, Klamath like algae uh, also has very rich in uh, uh, phenylethylamine, um, which is uh, known as the love chemical. It's a chemical that's coursing through your brain um, when you're feeling like you're in love. It's a neurotransmitter that basically is correlated with various states of bliss. And blue-green algae and chocolate are probably the two highest food source of that particular um, nutrient. So blue-green, if you're looking to support, if you're feeling depressed, it's middle of winter, you haven't seen the sun for months, you're like, oh my god, my life sucks, blue-green algae might be your best choice out of those three <laughs> algae. Unfortunately, um, blue-green algae from Klamath Lake is the most expensive of these three. <coughs> um, wheatgrass, oatgrass, barley grass powder. People worry about these because of the gluten issue, um, but you can be assured that grasses have no gluten in them. The grains that grasses grow out of have gluten, but the grasses themselves do not. However, sometimes when someone's harvesting wheatgrass, because maybe they're growing it in a tray, um, as they harvest it, they pull some of the grains out of the soil, and those grains get in with the grass as it's processed and dried and ground into a powder, and you end up with gluten contamination in your wheatgrass. Um, so if, you're if you have a gluten sensitivity and you're concerned about that, you want to purchase these powders from companies that are actually testing to verify there's no gluten contamination. The reason these powders are so great is they're so rich in alkalizing minerals. These are the, some of the most alkalizing foods on the planet. Yeah, so if your tissues are running acidic, you're having um, metabolic acidosis problems, these are great foods to assist in um, really alkalizing your body with a lot of alkalizing minerals. Um, and certain greens you get at the grocery store, kale, chard, spinach, collards, parsley, all green greens thrown in a smoothie, all incredibly micronutrient rich, assuming they're grown in micronutrient rich soil. Probably the most nutrient rich Micronutrient rich land based vegetables, dandelion leaf. Um, kind of ironic that we're spraying and weeding and yeah. trying to get rid of the thing that could actually help us, right? Modern humans, we're all micronutrient deficient. We're living in this stressed out world. We're desperate for micronutrients. And there it is, growing right there in our lawn. And what do we do? We spray it, we weed it, we kill it. We're like, get out of here, get away from me. Meanwhile, it could actually be the thing that actually brings us back from the brink of disease. Um, it's kind of ironic that we do that. Nettles as well. Nettles and dandelion are probably the two most nutrient, micronutrient rich land based vegetables. Um, incredibly rich in iron uh, and a variety of other 
um, minerals and vitamins. Uh, so we should be incorporating these things into our diet, not trying to spray them and get rid of them. What about in tea, too? I have to mind the tea, you can't mind tea. You can do that, yeah. I mean, you know, as long as they, you know, the heat will destroy B vitamins to some extent. So that, just be aware of that and maybe not put it in piping hot water that was just boiling or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, so somebody else have a question? Yeah, I had a question about what stage of the dandelion? Is it the, uh, good question. the white uh, top or the... It's all parts of dandelion can be eaten. You can eat the root, you can eat the flower, you can eat the leaves. Um, so, but specifically, the nutritional profile that I gave you right here is for the leaf. So, and the leaf in the springtime is usually really prominent, and, and again in the fall it tends to become prominent. So, but you can get dandelion all through the year. You can actually get the leaf. But remember, when the plant is flowering and producing the seeds, it's putting a lot of energy into those seeds. So the leaf at that time is probably going to be less nutrient rich than it was, you know, in the spring when the plant is just kind of sprouting up. So spring dandelion, just like spring grass, before it flowers is definitely the best in terms of micronutrient levels. But then when the, when the plant's flowering, just pick the flowers and eat them, right? I mean, because those are super, I almost see as like eating the sun. I mean, I just love to just chomp on dandelion plants. I mean, they're just so yellow and full of sunlight energy, obviously. And, um, so, um, alfalfa is another great thing. Unfortunately, it's been um, genetically modified, so you gotta be careful and only buy organically grown alfalfa. Um, it sends its roots way down into the soil, um, and so it brings up lots of nutrients um, from, from deep in, in the earth, and, and you can get those nutrients by eating alfalfa. Moringa leaf is the most nutrient-rich tropical vegetable. That actually is um, a, the leaf of a tropical tree. And uh, in countries where uh, people are starving, you know, starvation is rampant, um, they're starting to grow these trees so they can feed the leaves to people to bring them back from the brink of malnutrition. Um, there's massive amounts of micronutrients. I mean, four times the vitamin A of carrots, eight times the vitamin C of oranges, four times more calcium, two times more protein than cow's milk, three times more potassium than bananas by weight. This is an incredibly nutrient-rich leaf on a tree. Um, sea vegetables, kelp, dulse, and nori are a big part of my diet. Um, sea vegetables are basically 20 times more mineral rich than land-based vegetables because they grow in the ocean. You gotta be careful where you get your sea vegetables from though. I really like the company that I've listed uh, on my resources page here, number 12, uh, as a source. They do a lot of testing to verify that their um, veggies are uh, um, free or at least low levels of contaminants. Um, so it really, the, the most trustworthy seed vegetable company that I've found. How do you use them? Um, well, I love to get dulse and sea lettuce flakes and sprinkle those all over my salads. Um, I like to get nori sheets and wrap up various things in the nori sheets to eat. Um, I love to get kelp powder and use that as a salt substitute for kelp is incredibly rich in iodine, which we don't have as much of a problem with iodine around here near the coast because our soil's got a little more iodine. But man, people in the Midwest are far from the ocean. Their soil is very deficient in iodine and kelp is a godsend for people like that. Um, so, and dulse, man, dulse leaves, I like to just eat them. I mean, I love the flavor of them. They're just yummy, and I like to just add them into soups or whatever. You just put them in the soup, and they kind of um, soften and, and add a really nice flavor. So, there's lots of things you can do with these sea vegetables. You can add them into a pate. Um, you could, um, you know, on and on and on. I mean, the list is endless. It's limited only by your creativity. Um, Shilaji, one of my favorite uh, superfoods. It's a fascinating substance. It's the number one herb in Ayurvedic medicine, first of all. Um, it's been used by Ayurvedic physicians for thousands of years. Just the name Shilajit is a Sanskrit word. Anything that is, any Sanskrit words that are still around, um, you kind of want to pay attention to that. Sanskrit is an ancient language which indicates that this substance has been around for thousands of years. If you go to the Himalayan mountains in the, uh, in the um, summertime, um, the rocks, vertical cliff faces, you can see a tar-like substance oozing out of the cliff faces. Um, and that's Shilajit. And uh, it's basically, um, nobody really knows what it is, honestly. Um, but people have found that it's incredibly beneficial for consumption. And um, 
people theorize it's the remnants of the tropical vegetation that was on the coast of Asia as India slammed into it in the tectonic plate collision, causing the land to rise and all the tropical vegetation to die, and then that composted into rich humic and fulvic material that was further compressed by the collision of the continents and biotransformed into what shilajit is to this day. And shilajit is the incredibly rich in minerals. It's every bit as mineral rich as anything on this list. Um, over 70 trace minerals have been found in shilajit. Um, it is, but the real magic of shilajit is fulvic acid. Some shilajits are up to 50% fulvic acid. I really like the shilajit from Omica Organics. I don't know if I put that in, the, in my list here. Um, don't think I did. Omica Organics, O-M-I-C-A organics.com. Love their shilajit because it's 50% folic acid. And uh, folic acid is a magic nutrient mainly because just like in the soil it breaks things down. Um, it um, basically heavy metals, um, pesticides, anything that's in your body that really shouldn't be. Folic acid will begin to break it down so that it can be mobilized by the body and excreted. So it's an incredibly potent detoxifier. Um, and as a result of that, I love to consume shilajit. I'll put a teaspoon of it in my smoothie pretty much every day. There is one catch with shilajit though. Fulvic acid and humic acids um, interact with chlorine and, and to create some very potent carcinogens. Kind of ironic because that means that fulvic acid is very rich in organically grown food. The better the health of the soil, the more fulvic acid is going to be in the plant because soil-based microbes secrete fulvic acid. So organically grown foods are rich in fulvic acid. But then if you get exposed to chlorine, you're going to create these carcinogens in your body as that chlorine bonds with the organic acids in the fulvic and humic acid in your, in your blood to create some carcinogens. So it's like the more organic food you eat, the more carcinogens you create if you're exposed to chlorine. So not, bottom line is stay away from chlorine. Um, don't drink that water. And the most prevalent way people get chlorine in their blood is not the water they drink, but their shower. So if you're going to consume shilajit with all this fulvic acid, you got to stay away from chlorine. And that means you got to put a really good shower filter on your shower, as well as on your sink, so you don't get exposed to chlorine. Um, and um, which I've done. I got a whole house filter in my house basically to eliminate all chlorine and then, then you don't get uh, chlorine outgassing from the toilet or in the shower or when you do the dishes uh, um, and just to uh, eliminate that compound from your life because it's such a heinous compound. Um, cayenne, I love to put cayenne in my smoothies because cayenne is a, is a massive uh, substance that stimulates blood flow. And you got a, sm a smoothie that's just loaded with some very potent micronutrients, you throw some cayenne in there, that's going to help drive those micronutrients into your cells. Open up your circulation so those micronutrients can get to where they need to go. Um, so a little bit of heat in your smoothie is a, is a really good idea. Um, if you're having IBS symptoms or problems digesting, is Kind of still recommended? Um, I guess it depends on how your body reacts to that. I mean, it, potentially it could irritate. If you've got inflammation in your GI tract, it could potentially irritate that. So you have to kind of tune into what's happening when you eat it. But yeah, that, that could be a potential problem. You might want to heal that situation first before you start adding a lot of cayenne. You could go with ginger, maybe something that's a little more benign um, that's going to get a little heat uh, and open up some circulation in your body. Um, cod liver oil, phenomenal superfood that's very rich in fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin A, vitamin D, and, and a little bit of vitamin K in there. And also EPA and DHA. Um, you know, Weston Price, the guy, dentist who went around the world in the 1920s studying indigenous cultures, found that the indigenous cultures ate about 10 times more fat soluble vitamins than we do in the modern world. Which is why we're all having teeth problems and osteoporosis and all the other issues that come with um, lack of fat soluble vitamins. Fat soluble vitamins are critical for proper calcium metabolism and bone and teeth health. Um, and so, cod liver oil is a phenomenal way to solve that problem. The issue with cod liver oil is it's not the best tasting stuff in the world, especially if it's fermented. Fortunately, you don't need a whole lot of it, just a teaspoon. Fermented cod liver oil is really potent, though, in terms of flavor. and, and about a teaspoon is probably all you're going to be able to do. 
Um, unfermented, much more benign, especially like Carlson does the lemon flavor, that's pretty mild. That can disappear into a smoothie pretty well, just a teaspoon of it. Um, you know, but it's not as easily metabolized. The fermented is much more easy, much more bioavailable than the unfermented. Um, but the unfermented is still a great option if you just can't deal with the fermented cod liver oil. Bone broth, um, another fabulous superfood loaded with micronutrients, specifically gelatin and bioavailable minerals, which help to rebuild the health of your intestinal lining and all your connective tissue. Um, it's just a phenomenal way to get micronutrients into your body. Um, sauerkraut, very rich in B vitamins, relatively rich in vitamin K2, um, and various lactobacilli. Um, so a great way to get bioavailable B vitamins into your body in, in large quantities. Organ meats, um, specifically liver, um, heart, another commonly consumed organ meat. Um, but most people go with liver, and liver is, there's just way more nutrients in organ meats than muscle meat. Um, so specifically vitamin B12 and iron um, and folic acid, things that people are typically um, deficient in. Um, so you know, making like a liver uh, pate or something like that, great way to get massive amounts of nutrition in your body. Obviously you want it to be grass fed animal though, because um, the um, livers of conventionally factory farmed animals are not going to be in very good shape. You don't want to be eating that. You want to be eating the liver of a healthy animal which has to be an animal that's allowed to eat its natural diet, which is grass. So make sure you're getting a healthy animal when you're getting your, your liver. Um, Pasture-raised eggs, I see as a superfood as well. Rich in omega-3s if they're pastured. B12, B vitamins, and choline, which is a critical B vitamin-like compound that supports health of your biliary system, your, your gallbladder, and your liver, um, and your mental, emotional health with neurotransmitter production, etc., etc. Um, and various antioxidants that help with eye health. Natto, um, traditional food in Japan that is incredibly rich in vitamin K2, which most modern humans are pretty deficient in because it's not really found in our diet in sufficient quantities. What is natto? Natto is fermented soybean. So how is, how is it different from miso? Which is um, miso is fermented soybean as well, but natto, the fermentation um, microbe that's doing the fermenting in natto is known to produce lots of vitamin K2, whereas the microbe is doing the fermentation in miso doesn't produce vitamin K2. Um, so natto is just the premier source of vitamin K2 on the planet. It blows every other food out of the water in terms of vitamin K2 content. The catch is it's expensive and it's hard to find organically grown natto. If you really want to consume this food, my recommendation is to make it yourself. You can get natto starter from culturesforhealth.com. Um, and uh, you can start making your own natto with organic soybeans and incorporating this into your diet. Just put the natto in your smoothie. You can dehydrate it with some spices in your dehydrator to have like a crunchy treat. Um, just eating it by itself with some rice is how the Japanese do it. I don't find that particularly palatable. Um, so there's, you know, I'll, I'll throw it in a smoothie before I do that. Um, Grass-fed uh, spring butter um, is another great superfood because of its vitamin K2 content. And a particular form of vitamin K2, which is particularly useful in our bodies. Um, what, what is K2? What, why is that important? It's important for calcium metabolism. Basically, vitamin A and vitamin D3 activate, I'm sorry, tell your body to start making proteins, which will help calcium get into your bones. Vitamin K2 activates those proteins. So if you don't have vitamin K2, your body can make the proteins, which will bring calcium into your bones and teeth, but it can't get it in there. The proteins aren't active until you have the vitamin K2 to activate it. So vitamin K2 is critical for the health of your bones and teeth. And uh, you know most people are seriously deficient in that. So there's 29 superfoods for you guys to start playing with. Um, and now let's talk about the superfood smoothie recipe. Um, that uh, Now this is basically what I'm going to go through this. This is just to give you guys ideas to create your own smoothies. To, to give you an idea of the sort of thought process you can go through when you're creating a smoothie to create an optimum smoothie for your body. Um, the first thing you want your smoothie to be is low glycemic. That means it doesn't spike your blood sugar. If your smoothie tastes like the best thing ever, if you jump out of bed and you're like, oh my god, I can't wait to drink my smoothie, you probably got too much sugar in your smoothie. So your smoothie should taste, you know, pretty good. It's palatable. It's, it's satisfying, 
but it's not like something that, oh my god, this is amazing kind of thing. You certainly do your best to make it as amazing as possible, but you don't want to put a lot of sugar in there. Um, and so, you know, I'm sort of pushing the edge here with two different fruits in this smoothie. One ripe banana and one handful of berries. You know, if you can get away with it, skip the banana and just go with the berries. Um, and then two tablespoons of chia seeds for that mucilaginous fiber that keeps the glycemic index of your smoothie down and the omega-3s. And chia is very rich in antioxidants. Um, coconut oil for the medium chain triglycerides. Coconut oil has these short chain fatty acids that are very um, antiviral and antibacterial and just really support your immune system. Um, so coconut oil is a fabulous way to, to really give your immune system some support and to also decrease the glycemic index of your, of your smoothie. Um, some cod liver oil in there for fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D um, are going to be abundant in the cod liver oil. A little bit of grass-fed butter for vitamin K2. Now you've got all the critical fat-soluble vitamins in this smoothie that are going to support bone and teeth health and calcium metabolism in your body. Yeah. Is dairy grass-fed? It is. It is. Yes. Um, you know, if you've got a dairy sensitivity, um, if it's a really strong sensitivity, you're just going to have to stay away from dairy. But you may be able to get away with ghee because ghee is clarified butter. What you're reacting to with dairy is the proteins. You, if you're lactose intolerant, you just got to stay away from dairy. I tried ghee and I react to that too. Okay. Over so yeah. Good so though, there, there you go. So you got a strong dairy sensitivity, you just got to stay away from it. So you, you're, you're going to have to get your vitamin K2 some other way. And you can get that by eating healthy, um, you know, animal foods. Um, you know, all meat has some vitamin K2 in it. You can get some sauerkraut in your diet. There's some more K2. You can take a vitamin K2 supplement if you need to. Um, uh, the next one is a product called Vitamin O Green, which I really like because it's a collection of 25 green superfoods and probiotics. So I've been consuming this particular superfood product, which is sold at Super Supplements and the, the co-op, for probably uh, 15 years now. Um, um, just a great way to get massive amounts of bioavailable green foods into your body um, easily. Um, the next one is my favorite vitamin C supplement. I give you the website where it's sold. I think this is the best vitamin C supplement on the market. Um, love to put some of that in my smoothie because you really can't get too much vitamin C in your body um, these days. Um, the next line is either hemp seeds or hemp protein powder to get some protein. You need some protein in your smoothie. And for those of you that are dairy sensitive, I stuck to the hemp protein because um, whey will stimulate a, a sensitivity reaction. Um, and, uh, and then bee pollen. Um, love bee pollen because of the bee vitamins. Bee pollen is also rich in lecithin, which really helps you digest fat. Um, and um, so I love the bee, bee pollen, most nutrient rich food on the planet, basically. A little cinnamon in there to help also support blood sugar stability, and maybe some other pumpkin spice, spices to improve flavor. Um, and then in terms of blending water or coconut water to the Add that liquid and then blend it up. And you add as much liquid as you need to to get the consistency that you like. Maybe you like a thick smoothie, maybe you like a really watery thin smoothie. Depends on how much liquid you add. Just an FYI about coconut water. Stick with water if you can. Coconut water, honestly, too much sugar. I mean, you know, eight ounces of coconut water, you're looking at 10 to 12 grams of sugar, depending on the brand. That's too much sugar. Um, coconut water is great right after a workout. But that's really the only time I'd recommend coconut water. And when you do coconut water, do it with some protein right after the workout. That's a great recovery drink. Um, it's going to stimulate a little bit of insulin release that will help drive the protein in your protein powder and your muscles to stimulate muscle growth. And, and, um, and so, but other than that, I wouldn't really recommend consumption of coconut water unless you get a potassium deficiency. Um, in moderation, you want to water down the coconut water so you don't get too much sugar that way. Some of the other things you can throw in a smoothie, if you choose, um, fresh greens, great. If you don't want to spend money on a product like vitamin O green, which is a little bit expensive, get some fresh greens from the, from the grocery store. Throw them in your smoothie. Um, throw a pasture-raised egg in your smoothie. Great way to get protein and B vitamins and choline and omega-3s into your smoothie. Um, for flavor, cacao powder um, or vanilla extract or even vanilla powder. Um, ground vanilla bean uh, you could use instead of vanilla extract um, to get some 
some nice flavor. One of the things that I found is cacao powder and spirulina go really well together. You can, if you've got some cacao in your smoothie, you can add massive quantities of spirulina and you don't taste it. Um, I don't know why that is. There's just something about the synergy of those two flavors. For me, I'm really able to get, like we're talking two, three tablespoons of spirulina in a smoothie if I've got a tablespoon of cacao powder in there and I don't really mind the flavor as much. Then again, I've been doing spirulina since 1987, so my taste buds might be a little off. Mm -hmm. um, um, another thing that you could do is blend some of your favorite probiotic into the mix. You got a nice probiotic that really works well for your body, open up a capsule, put it in your smoothie right after your smoothie's done, or just as your smoothie's ending the blending process, put that probiotic in there and let blend it in and then stop the blender quickly so you don't oxidize the, the probiotics. Um, and the probiotics will go to work pre-digesting a lot of the nutrients and multiplying so you get a that's a way to increase the uh, potency of your probiotic by adding it to your smoothie, basically. Um, smoothie is very easy to digest, so it's not going to stimulate a lot of stomach acid secretion. Um, so the probiotics are not going to have trouble surviving stomach acid in that situation. Plus, they're multiplying because there's lots of food in the smoothie for them. They're eating up all the sugar and converting it into more probiotics. Um, you could use milk kefir. As a, uh, instead of a probiotic supplement you, that you make, you can make some coconut water kefir, you can make some water kefir. These are probiotic drinks that you can make at home or potentially purchase and use that as a liquid to blend up your smoothie. So that's another great way to support improving the health of your GI tract, get a lot of probiotics in your smoothie. So this is just a very um, a variable smoothie recipe that you can start to play around with to um, um, just get um, nutrients into your body in a low glycemic way. Well, as I suspected, I, I covered way too, I brought way too much material. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to do a class in October on immunity. And so we'll get into this immunity topic then. Um, but just briefly, I'm going to touch on this adaptogenic super herbs topic. And we can, we can discuss that and then we'll kind of call it a wrap. Um, so one thing to be aware of, um, one of the micronutrients that we're seriously deficient of in, in the modern world is something called phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are um, nutrients in plants, basically, that are not traditional nutrients per se. In other words, your body doesn't necessarily require them to work. So you can get by without phytonutrients in your diet. but Phytonutrients optimize your physiology. They're very beneficial to consume in terms of antioxidant uh, um, function, in terms of immune support function. There's many different ways that phytonutrients, plant nutrients that are not nutrients per se, um, optimize your physiology. And phytonutrients are basically part of the plant's immune system. You know, plants don't want to be eaten either. They have immune systems and these phytonutrients are part of the plant's immune system that helps protect them from bacteria and fungi and all sorts of uh, predators in the plant world. And when we consume these phytonutrients, they help us, our bodies, protect themselves from these potential problems like you know microbes and fungus and really help support our immune system as well as help reduce inflammation by, by acting as antioxidants. Um, so phytonutrients are really critical and we're not getting phytonutrients in the modern diet. All indigenous cultures would make these brine, these broths. They would go wildcraft herbs and roots and barks in the forest, throw them into a big pot and just boil that for days in the, in the central teepee or whatever of the community. And then they would just drink that liquid as a tonic. Um, this, most of the indigenous cultures we know about did something like this to get all these phytonutrients coming into their bodies. We don't do that anymore. And, and these phytonutrients, these compounds are typically associated with the bitter and the astringent flavors in the foods. Um, and so what we don't eat those kind of foods anymore. We don't eat dandelion. This is a food with a lot of phytonutrients in it because it's very bitter. And, and uh, you know, um, you go out into the forest and wildcraft greens or vegetables out there, they're all going to be bitter. They're all going to have nuances of astringent, bitter flavors, not really taste all that great. Um, 
but we don't eat foods like that anymore. In fact, modern foods, look at lettuce. Lettuce doesn't have any phytonutrients in it. Lettuce is, you look at what lettuce came from originally, it was a gnarly plant. Thorns, super bitter, but over the thousands of years of hybridization, all the bitter and astringent flavors were hybridized out of, the, out of lettuce. And now we have this super bland, super palatable food that we eat. And this, this is the foods that we eat. We eat these super bland, super palatable, highly hybridized foods that don't have any, any phytonutrients in them anymore. We don't eat crab apples. We eat highly hybridized Fuji apples full of sugar um, with no phytonutrients, virtually no phytonutrients in them compared to the old versions. Um, and our soil is so depleted that even if we were getting the you know, old style uh, plants and eating those, there's so little nutrients in the soil that the plants can't even really produce a lot of phytonutrients. Um, so we are seriously phytonutrient deficient at a time when we need immune support and help reducing inflammation more than ever. Um, so this is a serious deficiency in the modern world that I think it's important to rectify. And, and so eat your bitters, eat your dandelion, learn how to wildcraft greens, you know, eat the bitterest things you can find. One of the foods that I really love um, that is just loaded with phytonutrients is shizandra berries. Shizandra berries, I get mine from um, Mountain Rose Herbs and I just store them in the refrigerator and every morning I just take a teaspoon of those shizandra berries and just chew them up and eat them. They're known as the five taste fruit. Man, are they potent. They are so flavorful. They have like, you know, they have bitter, they have astringent, they have sour, they have a little bit of sweet, they have salty. All five flavors are present in, in shizandra berries. And man, it just makes you pucker when you chew up those shizandra berries and eat them. But shizandra is just an incredible um, uh, herb to, to have in your diet. So there are many different types of herbs with different types of phytonutrients that are medicinal in your body that have various medicinal functions. I'm just going to focus on one class of herbs that I think are really important for modern humans and then we're going to, we're going to close it up here. And so I'm going to talk about adaptogens. Um, I'm really big on adaptogens mainly because what are adaptogens? Um, they basically improve your body's ability to deal with stress and they help you, they really support your adrenal glands which are really the way that your body deals with stress. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but living in the modern world, I got a, what I would consider a fairly low stress lifestyle compared to a lot of people I know. Um, so it's like, and I feel like I'm way too stressed out. And so it's like, man, I got compassion for what I see in other people, you know, the lifestyle that they're leading. And we are stressed in the modern world. And, and it's so important to support ourselves with these phytonutrient rich um, herbs that are adaptogenic. Uh, to stay healthy, living in the modern world. So I've listed six different adaptogens here that I really like, and I personally take um, Shizandra, Ashwagandha, Foti, and Siberian Ginseng right now. I kind of like to rotate my adaptogens a little bit, so I, I don't always take those four. Sometimes I'll stop taking Foti for a while and take some holy basil. Um, it's good to rotate your adaptogens because your body kind of adapts to the adaptogens. When you first take an adaptogen, the effects are very potent and it really supports your body's stress response. But after months of taking that same adaptogen, your body's kind of adapted to it and the effect of that adaptogen is not nearly as strong. So then you switch to another adaptogen and, and you just keep rotating your adaptogens that way and, and you continue to support your body. So, you know, I basically order some of these adaptogens from the companies in the, your resources and I have them in my cupboard. Um, in glass to preserve them um, and in the morning I'll take like half a teaspoon and I use extracts right you these are all from the roots of these except for Sean Shazandra berries are the actual berries and holy basil is, is a leaf but the rest of these are from the roots of the plant and you could take the roots of the plant dry them and grind them up into a powder but they're not going to be very potent um, pharmacologically because there's going to be a lot of fiber there so I like to actually take an extract of these adaptogens. So the, the um, phytonutrients have been extracted out with water, um, you, oftentimes hot water, um, and therefore concentrated. So I like to purchase, like from Jing Herbs, I'll get the Siberian ginseng extract, 
which is like a potency of, I think, 30 to 1 over the, just the dried Siberian ginseng root. So I take a half teaspoon of each of the adaptions in the morning, just put them in 8 ounces of water, you know, swirl it around and down the hatch, basically, as a way to just support my body dealing with the stress of the modern world. I think it's critical um, to have adaptogens coming into your body. And then it's good to do these on an empty stomach, away from your other food. Um, you, know, you could throw them in a smoothie, but I think that you're going to get more benefits if you just take them on an empty stomach away from your food. So I typically, this is the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning. I put a bunch of adaptogens, whatever I happen to have in my cupboard, in a glass, pour some water in, swirl it up, drink it, and then I take my teaspoon of Shizanda berry and eat it. And then I'm on with my day. Um, hopefully dealing with the stress of my life a little better than I would have had I not done this. So um, this is uh, a way you can support yourself living in the modern world. Um, the topic I really didn't get to is medicinal mushrooms, so I'll get to that when I do a talk on immunity in October. Um, there you have it. Do you guys have any questions? What was the company that you were uh, getting it from? Do you remember? Just, just food. Okay. Yeah. You know, probably was not an issue. There's probably so little rice in there that it's just, you get more, you're worried about the starch. I mean, you get more potential feeding of candida if you just eat some berries than, than you get in that supplement. So I definitely wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's not really an issue. It's just, in there probably as a flow agent for the tabling process in very minute quantities. And nothing to worry about. Okay, and then I just switched to a soil-based probiotic because Chris Kresser, Kresser recommended that on his website. Love that probiotic. I'm taking it myself. Placebo. I think it's a great Placebo. probiotic. Yeah, and it's, yeah. yeah Prescript Assist. Yeah, Prescript Assist. Yeah. I, I heard that. It's, yeah, I think it's going fine. It's interesting. I had never heard about um, soil probiotics before. So yeah. it's interesting to switch from that because I've been on a year, I've been on just a normal yeah, soil-based microbes. Some, you know, there's a lot of controversy and debate, and, and I, uh, I don't think there's been any conclusive research. But soil-based microbes, many people theorize, are the dominant microbe in our GI tract, um, and the lactobacillus are more of a minor player, like the acidophilus and bifidus, compared to the soil-based microbes. So yes, I think that soil-based microbes are critically important. You look at the cultures that play in dirt a lot, you know, instead of kids in front of computers are out playing in the dirt, they don't have any food allergies. Um, so these soil-based microbes get incorporated into our intestinal ecology as we eat foods that have some dirt on it, and, and then we are maintain our health much better. So yeah, I'm, I'm just intuitively, to me, soil-based microbes feel like a really important piece of the puzzle to really repairing the gut, um, at least for me. So, and we'll, see, and we'll see how that goes. But so far, so good with me with that probiotic. I've been, um, been having some good, good results. So. Cool. And my last question was just a quick one raw eggs and raw liver. I heard a podcast that she was putting um, a good source uh, raw liver into her smoothie. It was frozen and she put a little chunk into her smoothie. Is that, can that person who has a weak, a weak system have raw eggs? Or and or raw liver. As long as they're from a healthy animal, I don't, I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Um, you know, unless you're sensitive to eggs, right? I mean, if you have a sensitivity reaction, eggs is a pretty common food sensitivity. The yolk, it's okay to eat. I never knew that. Raw. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. If it's a healthy animal, I mean, you can have contamination on eggs, but if it's a healthy animal, that contamination is very unlikely. The contamination, like salmonella, will happen when you have a very unhealthy chickens living in their own excrement. And um, you know, producing very unhealthy eggs that get contaminated in the shell, and so um, you know, if you're getting eggs from healthy animals, I don't think it will be a problem. Um, so. Yeah, I would agree with you that um, food-based um, supplements are preferred. The challenge that I see is that for a lot of people who have malabsorption issues, they need higher doses, and that's kind of where the synthetic comes into play. 
Um, yeah. Has that been your experience? You well, I, mean, I have definitely not had as much experience as you've had in that issue, so I definitely defer to you on that. And, and I think there's probably some truth to that. I mean, you know, it's like you, you, you can get massive levels of potency in an isolate because the compound is isolated, whereas in a food grown or food based or superfood type thing, in, in addition to the micronutrient, vitamin or whatever, you've got fiber, you've got protein, you've got carbs, and some of that fiber could potentially bind with the nutrients and it's, you know, getting carried out of the body instead of available for absorption. So, so yeah, I mean, you can get way higher potency and if somebody's seriously deficient in something, it may be worthwhile to start with a synthetic high potency nutrient to re replenish. I think that's probably a good protocol. I, I just think that once the deficiency is corrected, mm -hmm then it's time to begin to transition into a more of a food-based approach that you know is good for long-term health. Um, so yeah, totally. I, you know, I, I, I definitely think that it's a blessing to have these synthetic nutrients available to us and for just situations like that. Um, you know, and it's, I think, long-term consumption, it's always best to align the food where you can, as long as it's working. Right. If it's not working, and you get your NutriVal done, and you're eating all this high selenium Brazil nuts, but you're deficient in selenium, obviously something's not working. Right. And so there's supplements out there that are like monoatomic selenium that you can, in a liquid, hold underneath your tongue, and can download directly into your bloodstream, and you can get massive amounts of selenium directly into your blood that way. And obviously, if you're having trouble absorbing selenium from your food, that's a great, amazing thing that we have that option. You know, it's not a natural food-based thing, but... It is something that can actually help somebody get better. So bottom line is what works, you know, instead of being uh, dogmatic about some particular paradigm, which I see many people fall into that trap. Um, so, yeah. The, the chlorella and spirulina that you mentioned, how do you know if those are safe? I mean, they're produced in, I mean, they're not, they're not going to be contaminated are they or? Well, if they're produced by a good company, they're not going to be in terms of the companies doing testing on microbials to make sure there's no microbial growth in there. Um, they're doing testing on heavy metals to make sure the heavy metals aren't off the charts. Um, they're, they're basically uh, monitoring the growth to make sure that there are no other um, unfriendly organisms growing in the spirulina bats. Okay. Um, so they're doing continuous testing, basically, to verify that uh, the you're getting a pure ingredient. So um, which one of these companies might have that? Um, um, might do that testing. You're looking for the algaes? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Health Force does some good algae products. Health Force, okay. Yeah. They, they do clamiflake algae, they do a chlorella, and they do a spirulina that are all really, really okay. good. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.